thanks so much for this day, this day of life you've given us, and the opportunity to be able to gather in your name, to, to just learn about you, to learn your ways, to gather in fellowship, and to be able to equip ourselves for service, to be able to reach um, our fellow man, our, our neighbors, with the truth of your word. Uh, we pray that you would guide us through this time, pray that your hand be upon us, uh, speak to our hearts and minds, and help us to just grow and to learn and to um, address issues mm. in our culture that we uh, that we see in your word that we need to share with people and to explain to them the truth of what's to come and um, to come alongside our neighbor and to love them and help them in, in their journey as well. Uh, just pray your hand be upon this time and we just thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for this place together. Praise you, and we thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 All right, so we made it to the sixth commandment, which is, Thou shalt not murder. murder. So, of course, there are some translations that will say kill, and which can be kind of confusing to a person because I remember right after I had gotten saved, you know. Um, I was very sensitive to that subject because of a lot of stuff in my own life, and you know when I read that, you know you're you're new, you're uh, not all the way taught, and so when you read that, you think kill that that means everything, you know, and um, of course with time, you know you, you study and learn, and you'll realize that it's definitely talking about murder. Mosquito it doesn't count mosquitoes, does it? No, it does not count mosquitoes um, because. <laughs> Yeah, we'd be in a lot of trouble because we we'll always kill mosquitoes. Um, so the Hebrew word is rasha, which is to murder, to slay, with pre um, premeditation. So this is the predetermining killing of another person with malice. And believe it or not, even in California, their penal code provides this definition of murder which is number 187, and I don't know if you guys are familiar, but that was a popular term, especially in rap music, as murder. And uh, so I learned about that through that first, and then when I looked this up, I knew exactly what I was talking about. So the penal code for 187 is, murder is the unlawful killing of a human being, and this is California, and it says, or a fetus, with malice a forethought. So of course that stood out to me because it's like right there in their law of a human being and they and add in fetus to that. So, um, so it's the pre predetermined, so it's something that a person thought about, something that they set out to do, and this is not of course talking about justice, this is not talking about um, of course what we see in scripture when um, somebody has done something that brings on the death penalty. Um, so it's not talking about, because um, law is not murder because it's not like we're just saying, all right, let's just go out and kill people. They have done a crime. They have done something that is wrong based upon the standard that is worthy of the death penalty. And, um, of course, people will try to, if they try to accuse God of this as, as being a murderer or killing, um, God is good. God can execute justice at any time because we have all sinned and violated his laws, his transgressions, we're in rebellion, um, enemy of God, and so on. So for him, it is always just to punish criminals, and that's what we're all guilty of. And so when he does it, when he decides to take Israel and take them into the land and remove the people out of the land, that is his choosing to do so, and it's not the same as going in there with hatred in your heart you're jealous because of this or that or because you want to advance your own life because you're just wicked to the core or whatever. Um, so the first murder in the Bible is? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. And um, of course we know the story of that is, you know, um, the whole um, Abel brought his best, his first and his best to Yahweh. And then Cain over a period of time brought his harvest, 
you know, so he had a different motive and so forth. But I think the key thing we need to look at to, um, to see there is that the fact that after Cain slayed Abel, that his blood cried out from the ground, and right. Yahweh heard that. He says, your blood, his blood cries out to me. So after he, had, he was gone, his blood is crying out. And I do believe that the blood cries out for justice, that something bad has happened, and it cries out. And then as we go through, we see later on, after God judges the world for all the wickedness that they were doing, one of the first acts he does after the flood in Genesis 9 says this. It says, So God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Something I think we have to realize, too, if we get in this conversation about God and, and, and this subject of, of murder and so forth, we've got to remember that God is a life-giving God. Mm. He created man. He said, be fruitful and multiply. After he judged the world, next thing he says, be fruitful and multiply. We see that even through all the stuff that we've done, God is still providing a means of salvation and a way to be made right, a way to give life. He's a life-giving God. He gives his people eternal life. And it says that he takes no pleasure in the death mm. of the wicked. So God is a life-giving God. He didn't create us to destroy us. Amen. He created, I mean, if you think about it, he provided up for all of our needs. He set us up as soon as we come into the world. We're there. We have people to take care of us. We have food. We have air. We have the bodies we're living in. He's provided all those things for us. And then he goes on to say, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, and on all that move on the earth, and all of the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Of course, we know how that's defined. We can look at that so everything. Well, no, we know that later on we have that kind of... Uh, that's after Noah, right? He yeah. Comes off the, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's so it goes on and says, I've given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is, its blood. Surely your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. And here's our big one. Uh, this is 9.6. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So here we have some very um, important things. We see that even if an animal takes the life of a, of a man or a human, God is going to have a reckoning or a accounting of that. And he also says, of course, of man, he says, I will demand an accounting from everyone who takes the life of his fellow man. So there is going to be an accountability. This is a high offense. But what we really see here is after we had this great judgment where God wiped out humanity for the wickedness on the earth, except for knowing his family, now we have Yahweh coming in saying, you know, he judged the world. Now he's saying, you're responsible for taking care of this. If a man sheds blood, a man, he has to be brought to justice for that. You know, and um, some will say this is the first act of civil government. That can be kind of, you know, debated either way. Uh, but I think it's just important to realize that because what he says, for in the image of God he made man. That's our key value right there of really what sets us apart from everybody else is the fact that we are made in the image of God. God is not a murderer. He's just. He um, executes justice. And he can take life because he gave life. If anyone wants him. And, you know, I've seen some, some of these uh, apologists come in along and say, basically, all we do is change the location. We've come into existence. We will never not exist again. We're here. We might change positions. We might move out of these bodies to a different body or location. But every human being that comes into existence lives Forever. It's right. just a matter of location or where they're going to live forever. So they're going to be with the Father and the Son and His eternal kingdom, or it's going to be in the lake of fire. So, 
using this commandment, it's usually, um, this is now that we've switched over, we came through the first three that really, or first four that are really direct with God specifically. Then we switch over to, um, now we're dealing with um, everything here that we deal with regularly. Uh, you know, dealing with our parents, or murder, or lying, or stealing. This is all stuff that most people can relate to. And so, um, so with this, I'll ask, you know, that question, you know, you consider yourself to be a good person is a good way to get into the conversation about witnessing and so forth because uh, most people will say yes, they consider themselves to get, be a good person. And when you ask them why this is, it is common to hear because they have never murdered anyone. Mm -hmm. And a response to that is that, to that, if they say that, so was that the only standard of good is murder? Let's get the response to see what they will say. Proverbs um, 20, uh, verse 6 says this. It says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. why we can use that. And, um, you know, several years ago, if somebody was asking me this, I would have told them the same thing. You know, uh, I remember back in um, on my job back in the 2000s, I was working at this one place. And, uh, we built bathtubs and stuff. And, you know, um, everybody that knew me in the end, knew that I was in the horror movies and all this stuff. I was in all kinds of stuff. I went to school for makeup effects and, you know, my house was just covered in this stuff. And if somebody would ask me that question, if I was a good person, I would answer it the same way. Well, yeah, I consider myself a pretty good person. I try to do good things and, um, you know, I've never murdered anybody. But um, that was actually a lie based upon God's standard and not my own. And that's what people are doing. Everybody, when you talk to people, they have set up their own standard of what they did determine what is good. And what we are doing is we're taking them out from that standard and we're showing them the reality and truth of God's standard mm -hmm. that they already know. They just, you know, whether they suppressed it or they've reprogrammed their mind and thinking to create their own worldview, their own thinking. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take them back to, to God's standard. So the reason why I can say that I was guilty of this is because one, and around 1995, I was in a fornicative relationship, and when we got pregnant, and she decided to have an abortion, which was her second one, and uh, it was my first. And several things, of course, stand out to me about that. Um, the one thing, of course, is that. Um, looking back and understanding my own thoughts and how I view things at that time was that from my point the issue was is that the only reason that I wanted to keep the child was because I wanted to keep her it was selfish it was never for the fact that I wanted to be a dad or that you know taking on responsibility or you know any of that and I didn't put up any type of really fight for that child other set for the fact that I just wanted to keep the relationship. But the one thing that stands out to me the most is that I did not receive biblical instructions or advice from my um, one of my parents. I'm not going to say the one. But um, so this happens, and I go to talk to them, and I got worldly advice. Um, you know, the whole, well, you know, you know, this is going to change everything. You know, you, you know now... It, your finances, you know, you have to work, you have to do all this, and, um, you know, it's going to change everything, it's going to be very stressful, we're not going to raise a kid, you know, because that's what's going to end up happening, and yada, yada. So, you know, of course, now I look back, I'm like, that is definitely something wrong with that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, because the standard is God's word, we're to stand by it regardless. What, I, what should have been said is that you've done this, it's happened, can't be undone. Um, if you take that life of that baby, you are shedding innocent blood, you're murdering an image bearer of God, and you're going to give an account, you're going to stand before God as a murderer, period. That might have changed maybe my thinking on it. But like I said, at the time, I'm in the world, I'm in full out sin and my thinking and rebellion and so forth, so I don't know what would have happened if I would have received that. Like, I don't know, but that's regardless from, from a believer who we stand in God's word, we have to stand even when it's hard to. Or we were worried about offending somebody or whatever it may be because um, that's the hard reality of what truth is. Truth ain't always easy to hear. <clears throat> so 
that was my first thing was that I was guilty of. But even if I didn't do that, I had a bigger problem because based upon Yeshua, if you have hatred in your heart, you are a murderer. I know in Matthew 5, 21, the Sermon on the Mount, Yeshua's going through and he's talking about murder. And, uh, and in this case here, he doesn't really elaborate on the so much the ten of the heart, but he does talk about it later on in Matthew 15. He makes it more difficult. So he says here in Matthew 5, So here, he says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in, um, shall be in danger of hellfire. So there we see that he's saying that, you know, it's more than just the actual physical act of this thing that you're doing. I mean, he's showing that, you know, it's not what goes into a man, but what comes out of him that defiles him. He's showing that it's the tent of the heart is right. um, being angry without just cause, you know, um, just to, to so what's a just, what's an angry without just cause? Me, um, my, my world, I'm mad at the world because of my upbringing or because of all these things. And so now I have hatred in my heart. And I want to murder somebody, or whatever, whatever it may be. I'm gonna get into crime, or whatever it may be. So, um, those reasons, or because I'm jealous, or because of whatever the reason may be. Um, so, we see that this is a lot more than just physical act. So, with that note, my problem was this: even though I never actually physically myself went and murdered somebody, even though I was guilty of the abortion, but I never physically myself went out and done this. Um, I was guilty because I watched these movies day in and day out. Yeah. I watched horror movies. I entertained myself on watching people be, be killed. And at that time, I had a lot of my own backstory issues. And so when I watched these movies, I was Jason, I was Michael, I was Leather, I was these guys and all the people in the movie that they were taking out were everybody that angered me and upset me, and that's how I was venting out my frustrations and all that. So I was guilty of that. I was guilty of because uh, I had it in my heart. I had it on my mind, and I was it just that was a way of life for me. I had it all. It was always around, you know, in everything. Even if um, I know that language specifically was if you have a just cause, even if you do have a just cause, you're commanded to forgive regardless, right? Did, do you think that falls under this commandment as well? If we don't forgive somebody. Well, is this, you know, once again, is this something that is individually something, you know, because I believe that as an individual, which we're to, we are to forgive, or is this something that somebody's done that they have to be brought to justice? You know, I think those two things kind of have to be kind of weighed out. So I believe that here we're, we're dealing with him dealing as an individual. So as an individual, yes, and plus we do have, because he teaches us to forgive, you know, but what is it... Um, is that say that if I see something being done, am I, am I supposed to say something or not say something because I'm forgiving? Um, you know, because I really believe that just law teaches everybody a standard, that there is a standard of good, and it's a preparation for that day of judgment that teaches us now that you're, there's going to be a day of accountability. If you've got a just law in place for, you know, saying you cannot do this, well, that's teaching the culture that you're not allowed to do that, that is, there's a standard of good. And that's why, you know, with God's laws, we, we, want that, we want our laws to mirror God's laws. And when they do that, it teaches the culture and the people around us and keeps that conscience awakened that there is um, justice, that there is um, a standard of good that's higher than us. So it's one of the things you really, any, any time like that, it's, you, it's something that, of course, like for me, it weighs on me to study it out. And I'm, I'm, I really believe in, in weighing out all of Scripture for that, you know, because there's several things that come along, you know, whenever you're doing any type of study to, to look at the whole of what's being said. Because like what you just said about forgiveness, 
how does that play into this? You know, so it's a lot of uh, thinking and prayer sometimes on some some of the stuff. I was going to say we really need discernment. Um, discernment, I think, uh, goes along with the individual. Like, you need to have discernment when you look within yourself and how you react to the world around you. The world's going to think it's strange that you can go non after their excess of riot and partying and because you have a new path that you're on, covered by the blood of Yeshua, that you're following his ways. You're humbled and you're conforming to the Torah and his ways. Now, um, when you get into judgment of judging others, because you're talking about when you come alongside someone others, when you're trying to be a yoke fellow, when you're trying to have wisdom enough to talk to somebody to say, hey, uh, you know, you're in sin and know when to say, know when to hold your tongue and not to speak to them uh, in a certain way that would be wrong. But, you know, I think today we must come alongside in, like you were talking about abortion, the pill is abortion. And uh, so many people in the church don't even know that because we believe life begins in creation in 18 days after uh, there is a fertilized egg, that you do have a beating heart and you can't, and it'll, it'll keep forming until the baby is born. And so um, what I'm saying is, is that how many people have committed abortion and not even know it because they just take a pill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually even um, birth control does the same thing. Yes, that, um, that's exactly what that is. Yeah, so, uh, you know, <coughs> Our situation, because um, you know, sometimes if, and give me an example, um, you know, I know that birth control can regulate menstrual cycles, mm -hmm. uh, but this key to that is that you're not having sex. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a difference with that than when you actually start having sex and the chance of, you know, having children. Uh, I know that we had our situation was like that. So before we got married, we, you know, I got saved, boom, sex was out of question. Wife, same thing. She, she got saved, boom, sex was out of question until marriage. But she had to, she did that for regulating her time. But the moment she realized of what it was, boom, stop, repented of it. You know what it does, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it doesn't allow for implantation in the womb. Right. Um, so it's still doing the same thing because, you know, the moment of the joints. Right. You know, that's just the next step. To that. Oh, so, so conception actually begins in the fallopian tubes, then it and then it doesn't allow for implantation. And that's and just so regular. And then it kills. That's just the regular. So it kills it after it's one. already alive. And then, but in recent years, they've come up with a new one, right? That mm -hmm. actually they after pill it, and all yeah, that Yeah, it stuff. actually it can implant, and then it sheds it or removes it, right? Yeah. But the traditional pill prevents. Well, pills. But it's the same thing. It's still right. I know. It is all yeah. the same. So and many people. So what we're looking at here is this. So even though I was never guilty of physically doing it, I was guilty in my mind and heart of doing these things because of the stuff that I um, thought about and the things that I watched and entertained myself on. I mean, really, if you think about it, I mean, that people entertain themselves on this stuff, and we don't really think about how wicked it is. You know, we can sit there and say, oh, I, I, you know, I watch this for entertainment or whatever. So, you know, it's in, it's in like everything. It's in, it's in songs. I mean, people, you know, I was in rap music, so they rapped about murder all the time and a lot of stuff. And for me at that time, if I had an artist that even had horror rap in it, I was like, I was always drawn to them because it went along with my other stuff that I did. So I was all in, you know, that's just what I, I've read. And, you know, and it does fuel, it does fuel other things. So when you really weigh yourself out to the commandments, and this is what I do when I talk to somebody, I show them these things. First off, it's not just the physical things that you do that you're going to be held accountable for. It's not just like when you steal and you take something from somebody. It's also not the act of committing adultery when you physically do something. It's also not murder when you physically do something. But also, it's also the things that you say when you blaspheme the name of God. Right. When you slander people. Mm. When you um, lie to somebody. These are things you're doing with your mouth. But Yeshua goes higher than he shows us the issue is the intent of the yeah, heart. Right. And he says that if you have hatred, you're guilty of being a murder. If you, have, you, know, if you uh, look with lust, you've already committed adultery. And so here we see that it's also our thought life that is also being exposed. And when you look at scripture about that, um, 
you know, there's several places that talk about that. Um, you know, that goes back to what Matthew 15, when Yeshua was talking, he says that it's not what goes into a person that defiles them. He says, but what comes out of them. And he gives us a nice little list of things that come out of a person. And um, he says this in Matthew 15, 16. He says, are you also without understanding? Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Mm -hmm. And they just defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemies. So there he goes and shows that all this stuff in the commandments that we're looking at is motivated from the intent of the heart Ooh. first. So we lie because our heart's not right. We steal because our heart's not right. You know, that's what he's exposing there, is that this is in this is in every human being. And this goes back to the where I, you know, where it goes back, we talked about it, I think, um, about original sin. I, I, I mean, I, I just stand on that. I, it's hard for me not to ever hold a different position that we come in innocent, guiltless, and we are not ever going to, we're good, we're just not going to sin until somebody teaches us to do so. I mean, I know that I've got kids. I, we we have to fight to teach them what is right. We don't have to teach them what is wrong. It's it's in it's like a disease that we have, and that's what sin is. It's, it's corrupted all of us. That's why when God made um, Adam, we're we're descendants of Adam, and we're yeah. you know He says, "Be fruitful and multiply, produce after your own kind." Well, what happened? Adam fell, and he produced fallen human beings, and it's been that way ever since. We we're, we're going to produce fallen human beings, and so on. That's why we need salvation. I was just going to say that, um, you know, first and foremost, you said all those things that you spoke about come from the heart. Because first and foremost, we are spiritual beings. This body is secondary. If this body is only temporary, like a braid of uh, grass that's, you know, here and then it's in the oven and it fades away in the sun and it's gone like a flower that fades away um, in the heat. So, um, yeah, this is really amazing that, that we are, uh, first and foremost, spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, oh, I was going to say, too, yeah, if you want to have a fight with your spouse, um, have evil thoughts in your heart and don't speak them, and you, you'll have a fight. <laughs> oh, man. It's not enough to just not speak something. Yeah. Um. 1 Corinthians uh, 4, 5 says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until Yahweh comes, who will bring to the light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Mm. Then each one's praise will come from God. So there we see again that when he comes, that he's going to judge the intents of the heart as well. And um, I know Hebrews 4, 13 talks about that there's nothing... Neck, everything is naked and exposed to him. Nothing that he's, nothing's hidden. Right. So I use that. Whenever I'm out witnessing or I'm out street preaching, I use that. And I'll say, all those things that you've done in the back seats of cars, in the bathrooms, in the basements, in the woods, that nobody else saw, God sings. And on that day, he's going to bring everything to the light. And one thing they like to use is like a, uh, it's like taking... A, uh, a chip that you recorded all your thoughts and everything you've ever done and then putting it up on the screen and everybody's going to watch it seeing all the yes. stuff that nobody else has seen there's a movie like that there was a movie made like that so yeah so I mean I know myself that you know we do we we all have a tendency to project ourselves a certain way but our we're constantly in ourself feeling and working and thinking and our thoughts and all this stuff all day long. And so, you know, I've had stuff that's gone through my mind. I remember right after I got saved, I remembered, like, because I, I never confessed anything. You know, it was just, it was, uh, whatever, you know. And I, you know, I was like, I got to confess all my sin. And I remember having to confess sin and knowing who God was and knowing who I was, how hard that was to do that. To say in prayer to God, God, I did this and I thought this. And it was just so hard to do. And then you take something like this, and I, you know, and I use that. It's like you know, on the day of judgment, everybody's going to be there. 
on that day, every single human being from Adam to the last person that died is going to be there. And I'll, you know, I'll go through popular people, you know, your mom, your dad, your siblings, your cousin, your aunts, you know, Michael Jackson's going to be there, Adolf Hitler's going to be there, you know, um, you know, Al Pacino's going to be there, everybody, every president, everybody, we're all going to be there, and we're all going to stand there, and we're going to see God execute justice. We're going to see him bring everything to the light, and those people be held accountable for that. No one's you know, going to be proud. Yeah, it's going to be one of the most devastating, heartbreaking yeah. right. events ever. You know, and yeah. um, so, yeah. so that's, um, I use that. And um, so, you know, we've talked about different ways. So we talked about how in our culture, I mean, it's everywhere. The people entertain it, they watch it, they talk about it. Um, you know, like, I, I mean, I was into that stuff. I was into horror movies. I went to school with other people that done the same stuff, thought about the same stuff, and, you know, and the stuff we talked about and the stuff we did, you know, and there's a lot, and it's, it's becoming more and more accepted. And we talked a little bit about child sacrifice and, uh, and abortion, and that um, well, there was a teaching I heard a few years ago called the Doctrine of Blood Guiltiness. I, I shared it with uh, Dave about it. And I don't think people realize the seriousness of what that is. And um, just to give you an idea, I'm going to read some of the, um, some of this. Um, okay. So Leviticus um, 18.21 says this. Um, it goes on, well, it says, it talks about all the sexual immorality and stuff. You know, it says, I'll read back a little bit. It says, also you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is in her customary impurity. Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defy yourself with her, and you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire uh, to Moloch, nor you shall profane the name of, um, of your Elohim, I am Yahweh. So there, that stands out here. You're talking about all the sexual morality, and then you're talking about not letting um, any of your descendants pass through the fires of Moloch. And um, I'm sure y'all have heard about what that is, who, who that um, Moloch is. It was this big statue. That, I think they said Molech Mal is, um, is Hebrew for king. And so what the people would do is they would bring their... Uh, their children, their firstborn, to to this big giant statue of a man with a bull head, and the arms would be held out, and they'd have a fire burning in its belly, and then they would roll their firstborn down through this thing, and they would pound these drums to drown out their cries and so forth. And the people actually believed that if they sacrificed their firstborn to Moloch, that this would ensure financial prosperity for the family and future children. So, think about what that's saying there. What does God say about the firstborn? Oh, wow. God says the firstborn is the, is the key to inherit it and so forth, is the blessing for the family and so forth. Here they're saying they're sacrificing it's supposing what God says. Also look at what it says. It says for financial prosperity and for future children. And we say, you know, you think about this, we think, oh, you know, who could do something like that? This is in every state right now. Moloch's still around. It's just not called Moloch. But every abortion clinic is the same thing. It don't matter what you call it. It's the same thing. It's child sacrifice. And what's the same thing that it says? It's the same voice. Oh, you want to go to college? Well, you ain't going to be able to go to college. If you're pregnant, you've got to raise that child. Bring your child to me, and all will be well with you. Oh, you know you want that nice car. Well, you're not going to be able to have it. You've got to pay child support. Bring your child to me, and you'll have financial prosperity. You'll be able to do your job you want, and you'll be able to do all these things. It's the same thing. And, uh, and have kids later. Yeah, have kids later, you know. And uh, it's it's hard, you know, it's in to think about it. I don't know if y'all know it or not, but there used to be a abortion clearing right around the corner, right here. Wow. Yeah, right here wow. on the drive. And the very first time I ever went out to an abortion clinic mm. uh, was in 2013. And so that's how long ago it was. And, uh, it was there in 2013. 2013. I don't know how long that one was there. But it was just right right, right around the corner here. And I remember us going out there. And first time I've ever been to one, I had a guy that um, was a pastor. And he's been doing it for years. And 
I went out there with him. He, he invited us to come out. And so we were out there, and I just remember how how weird it felt being there, just standing there knowing that that people were going in there, and that's what they were doing. It just it was a darkness there, and it, but yet you're in an environment that looks normal. You know, it's a nice brick building, cars and businesses are all around this, and they got their title, you know, Woman's Choice, and or whatever it was called. And it's like it's like that everywhere. And most clinics or meals have a church right beside of it. And then people are riding by every 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 Sunday or every Saturday, going to their fellowship, riding right by the abortion clinic. And image bearers of God are being slaughtered, you know, in this nation. So with that in mind, I want to read this to you. This is in numbers. I just wanted to say one thing. Uh about, um, and just to comment on what you were saying, um, the battle at Mount Carmel with Elijah, uh, Elijah or Elijah, one of the two, uh, had the battle at Mount Carmel with the uh, the uh, 400 prophets of Baal, or maybe it was 850, it was a lot, right? And he commanded them all to be there when he, when he confronted Ahab after the drought. With, this is with Jezebel too, right? And, and so, um, uh, the real problem there was they were the prophets of Baal. That's where they were sacrificing their children for a temporary crop. For a yearly temporary crop or something better, something temporary, they were sacrificing a human life. And then uh, at the end of it, when the Baals were doing all this all day long, they couldn't even get Baal to move. And then one simple prayer from Elijah, God came down and devoured the water, the wood, the stone, everything, and it was complete. I mean, and so the people, he said, why do you halt from it? Uh, because the people weren't answering. When he answered them, whose side are you on? They wouldn't answer him a question. They're common people because they were dumbed down, and it came from the top down because the kings were first ignorant. That's why, and they taught the people so because, remember, this is the northern kingdom, right? And, and uh, Jeroboam put uh, uh, a golden calf in Dan and somewhere else. They put two golden calves and because they were scared of the real place of, you know, worship. So um, it, it happens from being dumbed down from the, from the top down. And then it, this is when you, that's why you get into sometimes you worship God, sometimes you worship. And... Um, that's the problem because it's the religion is so watered down. We don't stand on the side of good. And it took this battle of the prophets. And then when they knew that God was all powerful, then they did took them, the priests down and killed them at the brook. All right. And another thing to add to that is what's the normal thing that happened that brought people back? They would go out and they read God's word. No, there you go. They'd bring you God's go. word yes. to the culture, and then they would see, and they'd be broken, mm -hmm. cut to the core, mm -hmm. and then they would repent for a while. You know, there's always the same. When you start straying from God's word, you start falling into idolatry, and you start creating God in your own image, and then mm -hmm. you just mm -hmm. empire every action you do. So Numbers uh, 35, 33 says this. It says, So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land. And no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore, do not defile the land which you inhabit in the midst of which I dwell. For I am Yahweh, dwell among the children of Israel. So, question to that. So he says that only by the person who sheds the blood can atonement be made for the land. Just since 1973, when the unjust ruling from the Supreme Court has no authority to make law pushed mm -hmm. upon the American mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. saying it's okay to do this, we're, we have murdered over 60 million plus babies in the world that we know of. That's not all the ones we don't know of. So what do you think is going to happen with all that innocent blood that's been shed? We can't escape. Who's going to make the atonement for that? Yeah. And that's just America. Think about all the nations. I really believe that that's what brings on Revelation is all the bloodshed from all because that right there is the most the most innocent people on the planet and the safest place is in the mother's womb. They've done neither good nor evil, and they've gone into that most sacred place that God created and they're destroying life there. They're getting it before they can get out of the womb. 
and we've been doing that. And I believe that's what's going to bring on because we can't make atonement for all that. You see the original sanctuary. Yeah. That's what got Jerusalem and, and Judah to get taken to Babylon, not just the Sabbath year rest. It was then when they were doing it right outside the temple when the kid runs out. Yeah. That, that same thing to Mola. So we're surrounded by it. And, you know, unfortunately, there's, like you're saying, there's a lot of watered down man made teaching. And even on this, you will not believe. I've been out to the mills. You will not believe the cars are rolled in with Jesus stickers and fishes on the back of them. And they, they said, God will forgive me. You won't believe how many people are aware. And they basically justify it and say that Jesus is going to forgive them. And uh, they got pastors out there. They, there's still one mill up here in, in Greensboro. It's the oldest mill in North Carolina. It's been here, I don't know how long. And they got uh, pastors out there that are supporting, they're actually helping the clinic take women in. Yeah, and so, um, and so it's so jacked up. So there's on that subject, so like I said, you, you can talk about this and there's so much to, uh, to really just um, to show the guilt of a person because many people have that in their background. And this, you know, we, what, when we use these commandments, that's what we're doing. We're showing the physical guiltiness of it, the things that we're saying, the guilt there, and the intent of the heart. And we can expose all of that when we're witnessing and talking. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring them to God's standard to show them that there is a standard. It doesn't matter if nobody's belief. Your belief is irrelevant. All that matters is whether or not you believe is true. Mm-hmm. And there's a standard of, you know, I can believe we're on a big giant ball of cheese right now floating mm-hmm. in the middle of some galaxy. It doesn't matter what I believe. Truth trumps my belief. I was just going to say that on television, by the time you're an adult, you see between 18 to 20,000 murders. So we are so desensitized, and you're right, unless we conform to the Torah and a standard of right and wrong, the Torah is a standard we all can have. And Romans makes it clear you have your old life something we've been affected with since Adam's original sin, that we go off and we can make our, we were, our hearts are an idol factory, as Jeremiah says. So we can, we have a tendency to follow our own path in our own way. And only when we change the path to the path of Torah, then we are, when we only conform to that, that's loving God and his ways, not our ways. Right. The, the written and the living. All right, so that's um, that's commandment uh, number six. Thank you. And uh, like I said, the, the memor- memorizing the commandments, I had a little memory chart, and the way it worked was it would have images, and it would be in the shape of a six, and it would be like a little bomb blowing up to show you to, to connect to murder. Seven was like a broken heart. It had the seven inside the heart mm. for adultery. Uh, parents had just had the parents laying together in the shape of a five. Um, you know, uh, Number three, taking God's name in vain, was shaping the shape of the lips. Three was the lips. So it was a memorization. So, you know, I learned them back and forth. And, and, and you know, and now I don't, I don't need that anymore to help me know. And now it's just, I know every, you know, you, you say the number, I know what commandment it is. Hmm. So I learned them back and forward and all that. So just it does. When you have that as your kind of your, what you're going to, it just, it shows the standard of morality outside of us. And like I, I hammer it in and I always do this and I, I can continue to say it. It's because we're made in the image of God, those things are wrong. And I always go to that, and I let them know that, because they nobody can give a basis for morality. It's wrong to lie because God is not a liar. It's wrong to commit adultery because God is faithful. And I always do that, so I use those things all the time. And uh, and, and painting pictures with people that they can recognize, just like the, the projection. I had a buddy who used to open air preach, and what he would do is he would take, uh, he'd have like all kinds of little props, and he would get out a camera, and he would talk about, you know, God's seen everything you do. He would use that camera when he was talking about shackling and seeing. He would pull out chains because visual things really play a part. You, it stands out to you remember that image, and then, you know. And he said, "Well, God broke those, his chains of bondage and sin. And he dropped the chains, and he said, you know, Yeshua set him free, and so on." And so, on. Mm-hmm. all right. Um, I've got a couple videos I'm going to show you. Um, one relates to what we're talking about right now with um, Sixth Commandment. The other one is a, um, a video that I put together. Because we just had Memorial Day, and uh, my former church that I went to, we did Memorial Day. 
the two things are there to show you um, basically ideas of how to get out and ways you can do it as a community. Um, look for events and stuff, and you can see I brought it because I, I hadn't really never I showed it to my church, but I never showed it outside there, and you know besides me and my family. So I wanted you guys to see that to kind of see what it looks like, and, and hopefully it'll be encouraging and kind of get some some thoughts going of things to look for. Because we just did the Memorial Day Parade in Thomasville. We've, we've done it for years. And the first one we did was back mm. in 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came to our fellowship, and they were looking for local churches to come out and help. And so uh, what we would do is um, we would, they let us set up booths and tables, and uh, we'd pass out water. So we um, I took up donations from the fellows, uh, from my church, and I'd raise up a bunch of money, I mean, quite a bit, and I would go out my Bibles, tracks, and I bought like. 40 cases of water. We had like three coolers, and, and everybody was just working together. And it's just um, it's one of those things that, and you always was, you know, I mentioned like when you get out like that, it's like like football. You go out and you start practicing with your guys. That bond and connection happens because you're working together. You get the same goal, same directives, and and it just it really, you know, the next day when we're in fellowship, you know, the next week, you know, everybody's talking about it, yeah, and just excited. encouraged, it. yeah, you know, and you won't believe how many people will come up and talk to you people that are burdened, people you can pray for, just loving on your people, you know, and it's a day that people are automatically in that mindset of giving thanks and thinking about the fact that they're freedom and all that, and the greatest thing we have is that we get to share, you know, our, our faith and so forth, so, um, like I said, I got a video, I want to show you all that in another one, so after this, so. You want to pray and then we'll go. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, Father, we just come to you once again, just thanks so much for this beautiful Shabbat and uh, yeah. beautiful sunshine, nice cool breeze, just a day to build and enjoy. And uh, as we came through this study, Father, we know the seriousness of what it means um, to, to not to murder, not to have um, just anger in our heart, and to meditate on these things or to entertain ourselves on these things. And um, just pray, Father, that um, we'd be able to take from this, to be able to use this as we go through life and as we go to work or we're out in the culture that we would be able to take these things and use them to, to lead people back to, to you, to lead them to Yeshua, so that they may see their guilt and the need for the Savior. And just pray that your spirit would move, pray for mercy upon this nation and this land that is so, so guilty of so much bloodshed in the streets. Um, your scripture says bloodshed touches bloodshed, and it's just more and more happening, and you know people are shooting up schools and all the stuff that's going on. We just pray that you would raise up yes. just bold men and women that would stand firm in your word and not compromise and uh, go out and reach this world for your, for your, your kingdom. And just pray that you would lead us to opportunities. You know those that are yours. We just pray that you would open the door for that and use us. And we know it's all of you. It's nothing that we do. We just thank you for when you do use us and the blessing that it is and the encouragement. And, uh, and we just keep our eyes on, on your kingdom. Your son and your word, and we just praise you and thank you so much. In your children's name, amen. amen.